Hey, good morning or good afternoon or evening whenever it is that you're joining me for today's Bible study. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. I'm dwelling, I'm dwelling richly. <laughs> I'm not dwelling richly. I'm Jennifer Richmond. Hold on. Let's back that up. Let me get some coffee in me. Hmm. Let the glasses fog up a minute. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Richmond. This is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Let the coffee in pretty quickly as well. <laughs> Today we are in lesson four, day nine, and we're going to be covering um, the last portion of our lesson, which is basically, let's see, kind of like from... I don't know. Let's see. Chapter five. Oh, I'm on the wrong verse here. Uh, chapter five, basically from verse 15 to verse 21 about there. We're going to go back and do, circle back a little bit. And I'd like us to read the entire passage that we have been studying for the past several days. So grab your Bible. Let's pray and dig into our study. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful for all that you have blessed us with. Today is the Monday before Thanksgiving and our hearts are filled um, with thankfulness, for gratitude, for your love for us, for the way that you're working in our life. Our hearts can also be filled, Lord, I know, with some concerns and uh, worry about what's going on in our own lives. And so we come to you and we come to your word this morning for peace, for focus, and for realigning our heart with yours. We want to truly dwell richly in your word today. And we give this time now into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully you are getting ready to do something fun and uh, maybe hang out with friends, family for Thanksgiving. And uh, this year, no one's cooking in my side of the world for Thanksgiving. We are actually going to go out for, for lunch somewhere um, with uh, my husband's mom and dad and uh, our son, and so looking forward to it, just a getaway day of just hanging out and relaxing a little bit, and then coming home and getting up that Christmas tree. We're gonna get that tree up early this year, get those lights up. How about you? When do you guys get your lights and tree up? I'd like to hear from you today. Do you do it right after Thanksgiving, the day of Thanksgiving? This year, I'm gonna try to do it the day of Thanksgiving because my next few days after that are really busy, and um, then we've got a fun Christmas party that we do every year with a bunch of friends on the first Saturday of December. So I want the house done and decorated. Anyway, let me know when you guys are up to. I want to hear from you. Tell me what you're doing for Thanksgiving and when do you decorate your tree? And when do you allow yourself to listen to Christmas music? For me, I don't listen to any Christmas music, even though I love it so much. I don't listen to any until after Thanksgiving. So get that last bite of pie in, up goes that tree. Up goes the Christmas music. <laughs> I might even listen to Christmas music on the way home from our lunch this year. Who knows? So, all right, <laughs> let's go ahead and get into our study. Mm. Get some more coffee going on here and switch screens so you guys can see the screen as well. Hop over. There we go. All right, so here's our lesson, and again, we're on lesson four, day nine. Today, we're going to be reading back through all of our passage for this last lesson. So I've already got that called up, and I'd like us to read through it uh, from the Amplified Version today. So I've called that up. There's our, um, oh, I didn't add the beginning part. I wanted to read all the way from 417. So let me adjust that, um, Ephesians 417 through 521. I like ending our lesson um, with a review of the whole passage where we've been. Does that make sense? 4.17 oh, through 5.21. Let me get that up there. 5.21. There we go. That should work. <laughs> All right. There we go. All right. Let's go ahead and read this out of the Amplified version today. I'm going to go ahead and close down the ESV for now. And let's get that Amplified nice and big so you can see it. There we go. So this I say. And solemnly affirm together with the Lord as in his presence that you must no longer live as the unbelieving Gentiles live in the futility of their minds and in the foolishness and emptiness of their souls. For their moral understanding is darkened and their reasoning is clouded. They are alienated and self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the willful ignorance and spiritual blindness that is deep-seated within them because of the hardness and insensitivity of their heart, and they, ungodly in their spiritual apathy, 
having become callous and unfeeling, have given themselves over as prey to unbridled sensuality, eagerly craving the practice of every kind of impurity that their desires may demand. But you did not learn Christ in this way. In fact, you have really heard him and have, if in fact you have really heard him and have been taught by him just as truth is in Jesus revealed in his life and personified in him, that regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self, completely discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires and being continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude, and put on the new self in the regenerated and renewed nature, created in God's image, godlike, in the righteousness and holiness of the truth, living in a way that expresses to God your gratitude for your salvation. Therefore, rejecting all falsehood, whether lying, defrauding, telling half-truths, spreading rumors, and any such as these, speak truth each one with his neighbor. For we are all parts of one another, and we are all parts of the body of Christ. Be angry at sin and immorality, at justice, at God, ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. Do not let your anger cause you shame or allow it to. Last, uh, uh, let me read that again, <laughs> sorry. Do not let your anger cause you shame or allow it to last until the sun goes down. And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you by, into sin by holding a grudge or nurturing anger or harboring resentment or cultivating bitterness. The thief who has become a believer must no longer steal, but instead he must work hard, making an honest living, producing that which is good in his own hands so that he will have something to share with those in need. Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others. Um, according to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him by whom you were sealed and marked, branded as God's own for the day of redemption, the final deliverance of the consequence of sin. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding and slander be put away from you along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence, be kind and helpful to one another, tender hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Therefore become imitators of God, copy him and follow his example as well beloved children, imitate their father and walk continually in love. That is value one another, practice empathy and compassion, unselfishly seeking the best for others, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and sacrifice to God slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. But sexual immorality and all moral impurity, indecent, offensive behavior or greed must not be hinted among you. It is as is proper among saints. For as believers, our way of life, whether in public or private, reflects the validity of our faith. Let there be no filthiness or silly talk or chorus of scene or vulgar joking, because such things are not appropriate for believers, but instead speak of your thankfulness to God. For be sure of this, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, for that one is in effect an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ and God, for such for such a person places a higher value on something other than God. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments that encourage you to sin. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience, those, the, those who habitually sin. So do not participate or even associate with them in the rebelliousness of sin. For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Live as those who are native born to the light. For the fruit, the effect, the result, the light of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn by experience what is pleasing to the Lord and letting your lifestyles be examples of what is most acceptable to him. Your behavior expressing gratitude to God for your salvation. Do not participate in the worthless and unproductive deeds of darkness, but instead expose them by exemplifying personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character. For it is disgraceful even to mention the things that such people practice in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light of God's precepts. For it is light that makes everything visible. For this reason, he says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine as dawn upon you and give you light. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living, with life, uh, living life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, 
intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what it, the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for it is wickedness, corruption, stupidity, but be filled with the Holy Spirit and constantly guided by him. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, offering by praise by singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father of all things, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. I really like reading it out of the amplified version. I feel like I feel like I could just, you know, preach a message just using, you know, the expanded wording here. It's such a great version. I hope you're coming to enjoy reading out of the amplified version and of course during our entire lesson, I hope you've been enjoying reading out of different versions and getting that. The amplified is one of my favorites. It's it takes the meaning of key Greek words and amplifies them like well, like speaking into a microphone, amplifies your voice, makes it, opens it up, makes it bigger and so people can hear it and, um, and, and grasp what you're saying from a farther distance. Uh, the amplified version does the same thing. So I hope you're enjoying that. And of course, it's so easy to access if you just get it over there on Bible Gateway or really any Bible app. I have an amplified Bible. Um, and it, that's a hard copy Bible, but I tend to just use the one that's online um, more often than that. And a shout out to my dad, who first was the one who introduced me to the Amplified Bible many, many years ago. Um, I'd have to look up even when the Amplified was published. Anyway, grab some coffee. Hold on. That's making me think now. I want to wonder when it is. Those few smart, brilliant people who are listening and watching right now on Facebook or YouTube. Maybe you're Googling it on the side. You can tell me, when was the Amplified published? Lots of homework today. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? When are you putting your tree up? When can you listen to Christmas music? And when was the Amplified published? All right. <laughs> Let's go back over to our lesson. And da -da -da -da. here we go. Our Bible verse, of course, this uh, session has been Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 writing that and hopefully you're doing well let's go ahead and say all of our verses i was a little bit confused last time but now i remembered i ended up um not picking a verse from chapter four because we ended up splitting and merging uh chapter four and, um, with chapter five and um so we're doing one three two ten three ten five one through two so let's go ahead and do that together right now you'll hear the flow and how it pulls together the themes of ephesians throughout the book and uh, hopefully you're getting better at memorizing it. Let's see how I do today. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Created in Christ Jesus. I think I forgot that part. 310. Uh, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a, sac a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How are you doing on that? Hopefully better than me. <laughs> All right, let me go ahead and get my head a little bit more visible here so we can see each other better. Hi. All right, and uh, let's go ahead and get this up and over as well. All right, so let's take a look at Ephesians 5, uh, 15 through 16 in the Amplified Version like we just did. Um, what does Paul admonish here that we are to do and for what reason? So um, Amplified Version, oh, scroll down to 5, 15, and 16. Oops, get that back up for you. Therefore, see that you walk according, um, carefully, living life with honor, purpose, courage, shunning those who tolerate and evil, not as unwise, but as wise, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence. So um, what are we to do? Walk carefully and making the most of our time. I'm looking at the, the verbs here. See that you walk carefully. And then all that part, not as unwise, but as wise, blah, 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 making the very use of your time for what reason the days are evil. That's the reason the days are evil. Because there's the, there's the reason, always signal word, because. There are two things that we're to do. Um, walk carefully, 
making the best use of our time. What's the reason, a rationale, a motive there? The days are evil. You, let's acknowledge, you know, let's acknowledge that. So what are three specific ways that you can make changes in your routine today so that you can truly make the best use of your time? This is a, this is a constant issue. And you'd be surprised in the position that I'm in as a woman's pastor, as someone who meets with women privately and, and hears their questions and, and engages with people on the things that they're struggling with in life. Do you know what one of the number one, I would say top five things that women come to me and ask me about um, help with or concerns about is they don't feel like they have a good sense of time management, that they have um, more, I used to say they have more month than money um, in terms of paycheck and, and that. But if you think of your paycheck as your time, um, you, you have more things to do than you feel like you have time to get it done. Um, and so Paul here is acknowledging that the time is precious and we need to make good use of it. And so what are three, what are ways that you can work on your routine today to make sure that you're doing that? So I'd be curious to hear what your three things are. Go ahead and jot those down for me and then share them on, you know, Facebook, YouTube or podcast, whatever, wherever it is that you're listening. And if you don't hear back from me, by the way, it's because I don't, if I don't see it, um, the comment, just tag me in it or you know, nudge it a little bit so I can, I can see it. I don't always see it for some reason, the way Facebook works. Um, but make sure you tag me in it so I can see that. I'd love to hear it. I think this, it, actually, if you post this, post it so other people can see it as well. Um, maybe on your own personal page and then make it public only because a lot of people struggle with this. The specific ways that you can make changes in a routine that help you to make the best use of your time. So thinking through your daily routine, what do you do? I think one of the main challenges women seem to have is they don't have a routine. I've met very few women who feel like they are able to have some kind of a, a routine. And now that's not a, a blame thing. It's not like, oh, they should have that. It's just really hard. Things get erratic. And unless you've got a really solid nine to five type job that gets you up in the morning, you've got to clock in, um, your routine is set in that regard. But anytime out of that, or those of you who don't even have a nine to five type job like me, it's hard to have a routine. I remember when I was a full-time school teacher, man, my, my days were very governed by tight schedules. I had a strong sense of routine. And since I've moved out of full-time school teaching, um, man, I really have to be more mindful of what my day looks like. And I, it's hard. Uh, like, for example, this morning at 4 a.m., our dog, our little poodle Lucy, she's here at my feet, she stretched. And when she stretched, she like angled out her claws of her back legs and they dug into my thigh and startled me, shocked me awake at four o'clock this morning. Um, the reason why I know it was four is because I was not able to go back to sleep. And I checked the time to see if it was close to waking up anyway. It was not close to waking up. So here I am trying to have a good routine, get up in the morning, go start my Bible study right away. <laughs> I lost two hours of sleep. So when my alarm did go off at six, I was so tired because I had been awake for two hours. Lying in bed trying to get myself to sleep. Anyway, the ways I can make changes in my routine to make use of my time. I have learned that I don't want to fill my mind with, with trivial things. The, I think of it as a slice of a pie. So one, two, three, out of all my day, my slice of the pie is going to be pretty well guarded on what I'm going to allow into my timetable. So I... I've stopped watching a lot of TV. Um, the only time the TV is on is with I'm in the kitchen cooking and I've just got it on mindlessly in the background just to kind of enjoy while I'm doing that. So I'm multitasking. Um, and even then, um, oftentimes I'm listening to podcasts. Uh, when I get up in the morning, rather than li listening to just random music, I listen to podcasts. I listen to things that feed my mind. Um, this helped me make the best use of my time. Um, when I'm driving, I try to for the most part, listen to uplifting Christian music. Um, uh, the, I just play the Bible while I'm driving, or I listen to podcasts that edify my mind. So um, these are ways that I've done things that specifically help me make the use of my time. I guard my relationships so that the friendships that I have aren't filled with just trivialities and just silly nonsense and things. Things The, the conversations that I get into with people, I, I'm engaged with you know fun and laughter and all that good stuff, but I make sure that I don't want to be wasting the time with people. Uh, people, I want to talk about our heart issues. I want to talk about where we're going and where we've been and what's going on in our life. And uh, so we make the use of our time in that way. I'd love to hear from you on how you do that. What kinds of people waste time? Well, evil people waste time, actually. They do. People who have no mission, people who have no sense of purpose in their life, they waste time because why 
why use it wisely? There's nothing else. There's nothing um, at the at the end of that. So let's take a look at Ephesians five, whoop, Ephesians five ten, and then five fifteen to sixty. Note any contrast and comparisons you can between the content of these pages uh, passages and five seventeen. Um, let's take a look at five ten. Scroll there. Um, try. You know, I'm going to switch us back. Actually, let me go back over to the ESV. Um, it'll be a little bit a little more helpful to be concise in our reading. I'm watching that scroll up. All right, so 510, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And then 515 and 16, um, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. So we have knowing the will of the Lord, and then we have this contrast between foolish and the why. So what kind of people waste time? Back over to question number three. Evil people, foolish people, people who have no sense of purpose. So maybe succinctly said, foolish people are the ones that waste time. They don't use that kind of time wisely. All right, number five. Um, now consider what it means biblically to be a fool. Read Psalm 14 and describe what a fool is. And I probably should have just consolidated. I just realized I had that kind of in... Well, that's two questions. All right, let me open it up to Psalm 14 so you can see that. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there is any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no, uh, there is none who does good, not even one. They have no knowledge. All the evildoers who eat up my people as the eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. They, they, there they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. So um, what it means to be biblically a fool in Psalm 14, well, a fool has said in his heart that there is no God. That's what it means to be biblically a fool. And they are corrupt and they have no knowledge. And you would think, listening to some of these atheists who act like they have no so much, what do you see um, as the motivation for denying God's existence? Well, denying God's existence is often the basis of living and justifying your immoral life. If I have a moral standard outside of myself, then I need to live up to that moral standard. Atheists actually have pinpointed this as a definite reason for their views. They deny the existence of God because they don't want to have. Um, there was a very famous atheist, his name was um, Aldous Huxley, and he actually admitted that his desire to avoid moral restraints was a motivation for his disbelief in God. So then you see Paul moving into moral behavior. The fools, they deny God, they deny God's existence, they don't live as if there is a God. Why? Because if I do that, then I have to acknowledge that if there is something outside of me, um, then there is something that might tell me how to live. And if I can deny that, then I can live however I want to live. Or if I can create God in my own image, if I can design a religion that allows me to live the way I want, then I can self-identify any way I want. I can change my, my identity. I don't have to live like I'm an image bearer of God. Um, I can identify as L, G, B, T, Q, T, L, M, N, O, P, all the letters of the alphabet and figure out who I want to be based on my personal preference. But when I put a moral standard outside of myself, then I have to go by his. And the, the perversion that we're seeing today is, no, is not new. Paul's writing about it here. And it's people who pervert the word of God to twist it to make it fit to how they. That's why so many people these days you see are uh, denying that the Bible holds a hard standard on uh, sexual behavior, our identity, who we are, how we were made, when we were made, and all that. It all comes back to identity. That's the core problem um, with most of the moral um, failings and the sins today personal thought on that. All right, according to 517 and Proverbs 9, 10 through 12, what is the opposite of being foolish? Oh, rats, I just lost my Bible lesson disappear. <laughs> I'm going to call that back up again. So I clicked over to the verse and it, um, anyway, it clicked over. Let me scroll down to lesson nine, get that back up. Man, I'm glad I didn't totally lose that. That's happened before. It's scrolling and scrolling. All right, here we go. Ephesians 5.17 and Proverbs 9. Um, 
There we go. Get that up correctly. I hit the wrong button. Let that scroll to life. All right. Therefore, do not be foolish. Mm. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's take a look at 9, 10 through 12. From Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied. Your years will be added to, to your life. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. I love the reference and the connection there with time. So what's the opposite of being foolish? Understanding the will of the Lord. Fearing God. Putting him in the place of preeminence. Not my will, not my personal desires and, and take on life. Paul sets up another contrast there in 5.18. Let's go ahead and explain that there. He says, uh, let me go ahead and move over to that. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. This other contrast comes up. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Pretty simple. Under state law, under state law, drunk is being drunk is referred to as also being under the Influence. How does that understanding of drunkenness also relate in contrast with being filled with the spirit? Well, instead of being under the influence of alcoholic spirits, we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So from Ephesians 5.19, list three ways and offer an example of each, addressing one another in, and let's go ahead and go through each of those. So first is Psalms. A Psalm is the, from the Tanakh. There's 150 Psalms recorded in scripture that we can choose from. So what are some ways that we can example any of those? Well, pick a psalm. So P for psalm, and then any one of the psalms that we can, that we can list um, that we would sing to the Lord. I would say Proverbs, uh, psalm, psalms. psalms 139 is probably my all-time favorite. And so addressing one another in Psalm 139 uh, would be reminding each other of the greatness of God and how he knows me and has known me and will know me. Probably my favorite part of that verse is the last one, verse 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. There's a psalm, right? Uh, that's, that's an interesting story in and of itself. Years ago, I uh, memorized Psalm 139 with my students years and years ago. And uh, through the process of doing that and meditating on it every day for years and years with my students, God gave me a melody for each one of those verses. And I ended up writing a song for each portion of Psalm 139. And so now I've got it all memorized. It still stays in my head because I have it all um, in the song, much like we sing hymns today. And so a hymn, ah, oh, man, there's so many I love. Um, Probably Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing is one of my favorite all-time hymns. Um, this portion of scripture, some people have referred to as a hymn, that, that maybe even that verse there, Awake, O Sleeper, and Rise from the Dead, and Christ Will Shine on You, was an example of a hymn. Uh, it was like a paraphrase of scripture that they might have taken, and so some scholars believe that that was turned into a hymn there. Um, other portions... For example, chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that at work within us. Some people think that maybe that was sung also as a hymn as well. And then spiritual song. So any song that erupts from our soul, enjoy, praise, honor, and glory to God. And uh, I... I, my life was always filled with song. My, my mom sang, my dad sang, my dad sang and wrote songs. We sang as a family, my, my sisters and I, and my dad would play guitar, my mom on piano. We would sing uh, at church or my dad would lead a youth group or whatever. And we'd, we'd sing. I remember going down to UCLA once when he was, um, I think working with either Campus Crusade for Christ or Youth for Christ, probably Campus Crusade on the UCLA campus and singing in like a, I don't know if it was a dorm room or our community center at a dorm, I forget, but I remember going there with my sisters, and there's my dad on the guitar, my mom on the piano, and we're all singing these songs. So those are spiritual songs. These are songs that just come up and come out of you and pour out of you in your, in your life. Let your life be filled with song. How beautiful that God gave us song. Don't you ever think about that? Like God didn't have to give us melody and song and singing, but we've got it. He could have just given a speech, but I, I love the idea, and I'll probably share this in Bible study tonight, but I love the idea in um, the creation scene of the world in Narnia. 
um, when when C.S. Lewis talks about how Aslan opens his mouth and he sings the world into existence. I love that 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 uh, beautiful imagery there. All right, so singing and making melody to God with your heart. All right, so number 10. For the second time in the passage, Paul admonishes us to do what? Ephesians uh, 5.4 and then 5.20. Why is this so important? Well, he says, instead of selfish focus, we become God focus. He says, turn to God. Let's take a look at 5.4. And quick reminder there. Let there be no filthiness or um, foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Yeah, exactly. And then again in 520, he says, um, giving thanks always and for everything to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thankfulness, 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 because out of that erupts the focus on what matters and how appropriate that we are heading into Thanksgiving and concluding on this particular passage for Thanksgiving and thankfulness. So Paul's wrap up is also an introduction to the next passage. Really looking forward to digging into that with you this next couple of weeks. Um, what does Paul tell us to do? And on what basis? We'll submit to one another. And then what does he say on the basis is uh, a reverence for Christ. And clarify, who is, this, who is to submit to whom? Submit to one another. Mutual submission. And then he's going to go into all the areas of our life in, in the next uh, chapter and uh, wrap it up there for us in chapter six. We're going to have a great study next week. I look forward to uh, doing that study with you. Well, let me go ahead and close with this simple thought. Alcohol is the effect of loosening up and lowering inhibitions. It causes some to pour out angrily and others to gush emotionally. About what? Who knows? God's word is clear. Don't fill yourself up with wine to the point of drunkenness. Be filled up with the Holy Spirit, so much so that you gush forth songs of praise, love, encouragement, and truth about God. That's the distinctive of a Christian. They are overflowing with the Spirit. They can't help but like, but be like the skies and stars, pouring forth speech that reveals the knowledge of God. That's from Psalm 19. Beautiful reminder for us today. Thank you for being with me today on uh, lesson nine. I'm going to hop over real quick just to show you um, lesson 10, our create and share. And um, so you can see that and hopefully have that ready when you come back to your group for uh, Bible study. But our create and share is always some kind of a way to culminate the study and uh, do it in a creative way. So let's really picture this in real life, create and share. How would it transform your church, your Bible study, your Christian community if you literally lived addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs today? Colossians 3.16 gives some guidance, and it's the basis for the name of this study, Dwelling Richly. In fact, let me go ahead and read Colossians 3.16. You know, we've kind of gone over to Colossians a few times in this Ephesians study, and I've mentioned it many times to you that um, Colossians is like a mini version of Ephesians. And here's Colossians. Um, let me uh, take a running start at it, starting in verse 15, 315. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Sound familiar? Here we go. Let the word of Christ dwell in you, richly teaching and admonishing another, uh, one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Love that. That is the that is why this Bible study is called what it is, dwelling richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Why? Because when you do that, it pours out of you, pours into your mind, it pours out your mouth, the way you see the world, the way you hear, where you bring it in, and the way you send it back out when you have been dwelling when you've been dwelling in the word richly. So if we truly lived out these passages, wouldn't we overflow with truth from the word of God as we talked with one another? When someone came to you hurting, you'd have life-giving word of God rather than man's words to offer them. When you felt the sting of strife and disagreements, you could easily overcome that with the peace and strong melodies of praise from the psalm. Like David soothing Saul with his psalms and singing, your heart too would be soothed. For our create and share, let's spend some time immersed in the word through worship. What songs of praise speak the truth of God's word to you? What hymn has brought you great joy and peace? Put on your favorite worship songs and write out the words to a psalm, a hymn, or a praise song on the next page. Thank God for your creative gift of worship. Thank God that we are his image bearers, and because he is a creator, so are we. Thank God that he has created for you good works to do and that you are his poetry in motion. I've created a playlist for this Bible study and would love to share it with you. Get the Spotify app on your phone or computer and go to my 
profile by searching Jennifer Garrett Richmond, then go to my playlist called Ephesians Made for More. Listen to my playlist or create and share your own, then write out words to your favorite psalm, hymn, or worship song on the next page. And I've just given you a page there. You can see it. Ta-da. There's your page. Go ahead and do that. I look forward to seeing and hearing from you as well and what your experience has been in this study. For now, it's time to check out, say goodbye. I'm going to go finish up writing my talk for uh, a Bible study tonight. Hopefully, I'll see you in person tonight or tomorrow morning at our uh, Bible study. I'm really glad that you guys are here today. Thank you. Be sure to like and follow us on YouTube and Facebook and the podcast, Dwelling Witchly. And leave a comment. Let me know that you're here. Answer some of the questions that I've asked. Until we see each other again, know, as always, that you are loved and prayed for. Bye-bye for now.